He's never failed us. Oh, we put our trust in you, Jesus. You are strong tower. You are refuge. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I want us to sing this together this morning. And let's declare that as we sing it this morning. Amen. Christ is my firm foundation. He's the rock on which I stand. When everything around me shakes. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why, so why would he fail now? He won't. Let faith rise up in this room this morning. I'm safe with you. I'm gonna make it. Yeah, we're gonna make it. Break to the it end. down. Rain came. We blew. But my house was built on oh, you. you, Jesus. I'm safe. Faith is in you, Jesus. Hi, I'm Pastor Josh. Hi, I'm Pastor Tara, and thank you for being with us today. And we trust that this word is going to bless you today. So let's go live now to the sermon. I prepared this sermon some time ago. So please... I want you to understand God is speaking to us because He is. And I can tell you this, I have no idea what's going on in the world because I'm not God. I know what scripture says, but I'm not a person who sees the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. And the thing is God has so designed it that we would place our lives in submission to his wisdom, his understanding, and his word. Not our own. Because he is God. We are not. And if anything I realize in the, the, the way we live, I mean, listen, if you had said to me 10 years ago what would have transpired in the world in the last few years, I would have, it would have been a movie. It would have been a Hollywood movie. Being locked in our homes and pandemics and viruses and chaos and wars and rumors of wars and nuclear wars and you know, all this stuff going on. This was what Hollywood was writing about 10 years ago. Now the news is the movies, right? And I'm not saying that to mock it, I'm saying that to say I have no idea what's going on in the world in terms of how things are gonna unfold. You know what I'm trying to say? I mean, um, we, we don't know if we're gonna have electricity or water or we don't know what's gonna happen. No one foresaw what was going on. What I can tell you is God knew the beginning from the end. And that's why he spoke to us in his word. So when we put the series together, it was really about giving you emotional stability. <laughs> 
So being unshakable was about emotional stability. I had no idea the world would be in havoc, okay? So this is the title of today's sermon that was predetermined. The title is Unshakable Part Two, What to Do in a Crisis. Now, you're not in crisis, but I can assure you the geopolitical world is. Um, I don't need to get into it. Those of you in economies, economists, those of you in government, in politics, what happens in Israel? Israel, scripturally, the Bible literally speaks of Israel like a clock. You can, you can discern the times we live in by what's taking place in Israel. Prophetically, God says, when this is happening, that is happening. When this is happening, so it's like a watch. It's like a clock, okay? And so what's fascinating is with what's kicking off, there's a lot of consequence. Now, you might say, well, pastor, I don't believe in all this stuff. I don't believe in all that stuff. I promise you, geopolitical leaders and economic leaders at the highest levels, right, factor in what takes place in the Israel region as a key fundamental impactor of global economic policy, trade, finance, it's central, all right? So I can tell you right now, all around the world, there are conversations, there are governments scrambling because there is a consequence far beyond what's going on in that place. So why I'm telling you this is that fundamentally, God already foresaw this and spoke to us for this. Now this is the thing I have to highlight to you because today, many of you, Many of you are going through crises yourselves. And that's why you don't have time to worry about other crises. Do you get what I'm trying to say? The whole point of the load shedding app is to see when you're in fine and someone else is in trouble. And you avoid the region where the load shedding is and the traffic, right? But selfishly, and those of you watching from overseas, load shedding is a schedule in which we do not have electricity by design. But don't worry, it's possibly coming your way too because... Um, uh, we're seeing this in first world countries as well. But the point being, humanity is only ever worried about itself. And we say, but I've got a crisis, forget someone else's crisis. So when we say what to do in a crisis, I'm still gonna preach the sermon I had for you because fundamentally you will face crises in your life. You will often face crises collectively, which is even more of a crisis. Is one thing's a problem, that's a problem, but a lot of problems at the same time is a lot of problems, right? And even songs are written about these things and, and people sing. And the reason why people uh, take substances and chemically alter their mental state, whether it is, it, is, it is alcohol, drugs, prescribed drugs, whatever you wanna call it, the idea is to escape, to escape the crisis we are faced personally and the weight that that comes with. Now, there is a burden to living on this earth. There is a burden. But the interesting thing is, when the Bible talks about you and I in God's hands, in God's kingdom, we are called children of God. We are his sons and his daughters. But when it comes down to giving us a description, we are called sheep. Sheep are not beasts of burden, meaning sheep don't carry things. Sheep don't pull things. In fact, sheep, by their very look, they're fluffy little clouds. They don't have sharp teeth, right? <clears throat> now, a sheep is fruitful. A sheep can produce wool and milk and many things, but a sheep is not a beast of burden. And what's fascinating is, even prophetically, and even literally in the Hebrew writing, the Hebrew uh, letters, Christ is literally called the ox, right? He is called the ox, the alpha, the symbol, right? Alpha and omega, the ox. It's literally the beast of burden. And when he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden to find rest, he wasn't saying, come to me and I will tell you about how to be chilled, brew." I don't know what, I'm so, I'm, I'm 40 years old now. I can speak in a manner that young people call old and irrelevant. <laughs> you know, um, I don't have what the slang of today is. I'm sure Jonathan would be able to tell me. 
But whatever the terminology is of, hey, everything's okay, don't worry. That is not God's language. God's language, Jesus' specific language is, I am the ox. I am here to carry your burden. Okay? So sheep never carry burdens. And even the Bible calls us sheep and Jesus calls us sheep. And that is why we need to recognize all we are in the natural world is just fluffy clouds with blunt teeth. We are not safe from predators in our own ability. We do not know how to navigate hills in our own ability. We do not know how to find our food in our own ability. But what we do know is if we have a good shepherd, we are fine. We are safe. We are sound. We are secure. So Jesus, even in speaking to us, the peace that he speaks over our lives is not one that changes circumstances naturally. It is one that says, in a place where there are predators, I will be your shepherd. I don't remove predators, right? I remove the power of the predator. How many of you have ever been on safari? Those of you watching in the Netherlands and all around the world that have never been to South Africa, you go on a safari, but this is the thing. The enjoyment of the safari is especially if you know what's going on. Those of you that are ignorant and you think a a lion is a friendly little cat or that a hippo is just a big, cuddly, squishy, sharpe dog. A hippo is not a cuddly, squishy little animal that you just, oh, look at the fat, they're so cute. In fact, hippos kill more people than any other animal on the earth, right? Because they're territorial and they'll trample you. You go on safari and the whole idea is you are in the wild, around the wild, but you are not the wild's dinner. And the whole purpose of you being safe is not you. It's the ranger who navigates the terrain and has the weapons and has the ability to protect you, right? And, and you want a good ranger. I remember when Tara and I and the kids, we love, I love the bush. I personally, I find, I think it's God's, I love, I love the bush, it's amazing. No technology and you just get to be out and just appreciate God's beauty. Um, and all of our friends from overseas, that their greatest fear is to be in a place of spiders and snakes and spiders' webs, you know what I'm trying to say? So they're like, oh no, no, I'll never go on safari. Some of our friends coming out from Singapore next year, they were like, we can't wait to come. And I said, you gotta go on safari. And they're like, what about spiders? What about snakes? You know, what about those things? I'm like, well, okay. But you know, you're safe if you've got the necessary protection around you. And the interesting thing is, I remember we were on safari, we had a great ranger, but this ranger was absolutely in love with nature and in love and appreciating. And, and I noticed that he, it probably wasn't my kind of ranger when it comes to a life or death situation. And he was telling us how he had a, a Canadian family or American family on his vehicle and, a, and an elephant bull uh, in musk, which means that they're in mating season and a male elephant bull is very, very strong and very, very powerful, decided that the car was its enemy. And... Um, chased them down and started ramming into the car over and over and over again. And so he got the family to lie down in the back of the vehicle on the floor and he had out his gun, but he could kill the elephant, but he didn't want to kill the elephant because it's a beautiful creature and it's God's will. <laughs> and so he was screaming at the elephant and trying to get it to back down. And he, he managed to get it to back down only after it had been charging the vehicle repeatedly for about a minute. So he said, all he, for the rest of his life, what's burned into his memory is these little American kids screaming, shoot the elephant, (laughs) shoot it dead, please, right? And um, the point is, you, you, you don't want a shepherd that is tolerant of predators. You want a shepherd that says your security is of the highest value. So here's the thing, the whole essence of of being unshakable is about your revelation of your shepherd. It has nothing to do with the people in your life, the politics in your life, 
the economic circumstance of your life. Those are realities. But in order to engage an unshakable eternal reality in your natural life, it is all conducive to the revelation and the knowing of your shepherd. The interesting thing is, our shepherd is not just a shepherd, he's a king. He's not just a king, he's the king of kings. He's not just a shepherd and a king, he is a priest. Not just any priest, the high priest. So the point is, when you start to see Jesus in his work and his authority, which is backed up by the work of the Holy Spirit, connected to the authority of God the Father, then your perspective of your circumstance changes and you start to function under the voice of your shepherd. My sheep know my voice. Now we've spoken about this, there are many voices in the world. Now last week when we began in Hebrews chapter 12, we started to realize that there is a kingdom that is unshakable. In Hebrews, 12, chapter, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 27, now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of the things that are made, that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is an all-consuming fire. So the interesting thing is the world is being shaken, right? Doesn't it feel like that? It does to me. It feels like literally it's being rattled around. And whatever we thought, I mean, five years ago, people never would have thought we were anywhere near last days. They thought raptures conversations and one world orders and they, people would have said, you're, you're nuts, you're making a movie. You're making a science fiction, right? But it's fascinating to me how now we really see, hang on a second, the world is unstable, right? Can I just point out some basic things? Our population's similar to what it was 10 years ago. We have the same sun, we have the same rain, we have the same oil in the ground, but it's interesting, isn't it? Things have not stayed the same, right? In fact, everything has just collapsed. And it's collapsed and it costs more. So here's the thing. There's, there's a very obvious insecurity in the world. Nothing is secure. Nothing is safe, right? No one is safe. It's a scary thought. Well, maybe I've scared some of you now. The world's being shaken. We used to plan our holidays two years in advance 10 years ago. Oh, in three years' time, I'm gonna go there. Now I don't even know if it will be a there. And I don't even know if I will be allowed there. Right? I don't even know. You get what I'm trying to say? So the world is being shaken. And the interesting thing is when the Bible describes that things are being shaken so that things which cannot be shaken may remain, it goes on into verse 28 and it says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, the word describing the kingdom is not the same word describing the world. So it's not the same English word shaken. There are two different words. The Greek for the first word shaken means to be shaken, right? But the Greek word for the word when it says a kingdom which cannot be shaken is the Greek word moved or usurped or overrun or overcome. Meaning that the world can fall apart but the kingdom of God can never be overcome. It cannot be moved. Why you build your life on Jesus, the rock, and not on the sand, which is all other, all other intelligence apart from the word of God is not intelligence. It has its flaws. It has its weakness. It has its issues. And when you build your life on sand, people were saying 10 years ago, invest in Bitcoin, right? I'm not against, I'm not against coins. I'm against faith in anything other than Jesus. In fact, what's fascinating actually is when God speaks about, 
oh, I won't get into it now. When God speaks about don't hide your light under a bed or in a bushel, the word there for bushel is a basket. And the word there, basket, you, is for trade. Don't put your light, don't put your, and your light there is actually your gift, your passion, your life. It tells you to put your light on a lampstand. And in scripture, a lampstand is always a picture of the church. So God says, use your gift for the church. Not to be put under a bed, and a bed has a whole bunch of illustrations, what goes on a bed, what goes on around a bed, anyways. But people use their gift to get success so that they can pursue sexual pleasures and sexual pursuits, and they're defined by those things. They're even defined by their sexual pursuits. God says, no, be defined that your light is attached to the lampstand, nor put it in a bushel, which is a basket. It means taking your light and putting it into a basket for trade, because you would go to the markets to trade with a bushel. That's what it was, was you would take your items to sell and you would trade with someone at the market. That's what a bushel was. It was like your wallet. Do you know what the Greek word for bushel is? Kryptos. Anyway. So the interesting thing is God says, place your faith and your light in me and my work. I'm getting ahead of myself. But here's the thing. Everything else is on shaky ground. Right? So you can recognize things on shaky ground. Now it's how do I become in a space where I don't become shakable. But the language given to the kingdom of God and the unshakable ways he is, is immovable. Man, that'll preach for 20 minutes. Everybody always wants to change location when they face a crisis. Get me out of here. Move, get me gone, right? And God says, you don't need to move in order to have me. I wanna, and I'm not speaking about this like God doesn't move us. I'm not saying like, okay, you don't have movement. The point is, stop running in fear from everything in your life. Stop running in fear from everyone in your life. There's nowhere to go in the world to escape the chaos and the crisis. And that is why we're seeing the world implode into this insecure space because people do not know how to stand. Amen. Hallelujah. I am preaching to myself. Psalm chapter 46, verses 10 and 11. Be still and know that I am God. Right? Be still and know that I am God. In the series Unshakable, we want you to learn to hear the voice of God. I want to speak to you clearly today. You cannot hear God when you are in a rush. You cannot hear God when you are occupied. You cannot hear God when you are stressed. And you will hear now for the next few moments, you have to cease. You have to stop. You have to stand still. I would encourage every single person in our church to set an appointment to spend time with the Lord every day, right? Set an appointment, pick your time, morning, night, afternoon. I mean, I even know a very prominent pastor who has a Bible in his toilet because he used to read magazines, right? Like men, it's a strange thing, we read in toilets, right? So he was like, I'll read the word. And he often has the Lord speak to him when he's on the loo. I'm not gonna tell you who because then you'll think less of them. The point is, all I'm saying is, if you do not set time aside to stop being busy. Right now, those of you are like, I can cease. I wanna ask you right now, how many of you looked at your phones during the service? How many of you have thought about things? Some of you are still thinking about things. Some of you are still thinking about what... We can't stop, we can't cease. Your phones are the most detrimental to your peace out of anything you have. But can you just stop for a moment, silence the voices, and then silence yourself? So be still. Set an appointment with God. I heard a pastor once say, if you miss the appointment, you'll find disappointment. Because if you refuse to let God speak in your life, he won't be able to speak and you won't be able to function under his leading. And when he's not leading you, you're leading yourself and it won't be good. And I struggle with this. To be honest with you, we've got three young kids. They don't go to the same school. Traffic is chaos. Life is hectic. Things are busy. One child sleeps in, the other's awake before the sun with the birds, with the roosters. 
right? He's, Joel literally wakes up running. He does not wake up and get out of bed and stand. And he literally is on or off. There's two functions to our middle child. Um, and, and so the fascinating thing is like our lives, and what, so it, what I've realized is, even as a senior pastor, if I do not intentionally set a time aside to say at that time, I will spend time with the Lord, I don't do it organically because life is crazy. And we will set appointments for our gyms, appointments for our bosses, appointments for our work, and we won't spend time with the Lord and we won't give Him space to speak, right? So it tells us to be still in Psalms 46, chapter 10. And then after we still, we are to then come to the revelation that He is God. And then it goes on to say, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. I have to, I'm gonna circle back here, but I wanna show you a pattern. Stand still, stand still, stand still, stand still, stand still, stand still, stand still. And then place your focus on Jesus, right? So, but if you don't set, a time the, if you don't set aside the time to stand still, you can't see Jesus. That's the issue. The issue is God wants you to cease from the stress so that he can point you to his son who is your good shepherd and deal with your stresses according to the word of God. Deal with your challenges according to the word of God, his promises, his instructions. We heard this last week, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 16. From that childhood, you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scriptures given by inspiration of God which is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction. But it begins with doctrine and the doctrine is who are you in Christ? After you receive who you are in Christ, forgiven, redeemed, whole, perfect, pleasing, you are now in position to receive correction. It's not condemnation, it's correction. Because you're a child of God, why are you behaving like someone who isn't? Why do you fear that you don't have a good shepherd when you know that you do? And then once you receive correction, which is now live according to this, it's the instruction in righteousness. Live like you're righteous. Live like you're righteous. But it begins with who am I in Christ? That's our doctrine. Then it is now how am I living in comparison? How am I coming against that identity? How do I live not like a child of God? And the correction is the redirection. This is how you're behaving, not like a child of God, but you are a child of God. The correction now says he has instruction to be like a child of God. Does that make sense? Right, that's the pattern. Now you'll see this pattern in Old Testament because Psalm says, be still and know that I am God. The Lord of hosts is with us. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 17, Israel's going into battle and the Bible says, you will not need to fight this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. Do not, be, do not fear nor be dismayed. Go out against them for the Lord is is with you. In Exodus chapter 14, verses 10, we're reading how the nation of Israel is stuck, the people of Israel are stuck, and they're literally facing death at the hand of the Egyptians after they have been freed from slavery. It tells us in verse 10, when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die free in the wilderness. It's so interesting. Whenever we are stuck in a situation, our eyes look at our enemy. And we say, the enemy is gonna destroy us. And you know what's so interesting? The Bible tells us, <laughs> they cried out to the Lord. 
They didn't cry out to the Lord in a fervent prayer. Oh Lord, we bless your name. What have you done to us? You've brought us here to die. At least as slaves, we had a life. That is worshiping the spirit of mammon. Right? I'd rather be a slave with a guaranteed meal than be free and have the enemy that can destroy me. Right? And they were in fear. And this is a common reality. I just want to encourage you today. If you ever wake up and feel like God's left you, welcome. Welcome to the world of the flesh, of life, of how our bodies feel. And then you go to the news and you think, okay, we're, this is not even, we're, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna do this? How are my kids? What are we gonna, how are we even gonna exist? And more fear. And it looks as though, like if there is ever a time not to be alive, it's now, Right? Have you, that's what they say, the good old days, right? right? But that is not the word of the Lord, right? So now look at how God deals with their fear. Moses says to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So now we have David writing, stand still. We have the instruction of the word of the Lord to the nation of Israel at one of their battles. God will fight this battle in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 saying, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. In Exodus, we now have it drawn out. We have this whole instruction to us. Do you wanna know what the Hebrew is saying when it says stand still and see the salvation of the Lord? It is not saying stand still and watch how God brings money and watch how God kills that giant. No, that is not the Hebrew language. The Hebrew language is cease all striving and focus. Now the word salvation, salvation by the hand of the Lord is literally in Hebrew, Yahweh. The name of our Messiah. The instruction is literally cease from work and see Jesus. Oh, pastor, how does that even help us practically, right? Do you know that when they were stuck in the wilderness being bitten by snakes, God instructs that they build something. And he says, everybody who looks at this, who has been bitten, will not die from the poison of the snakes, right? Now there's plus minus between three and five million of them traveling in the desert at the time. What was it that they were instructed? They were saying, we're dying because we're getting bitten by snakes, left, right, and center. And God says, build me something. And when people stare at that, they will receive supernatural healing from their bite. You know what it was? It was a bronze stick with a snake on it. You know, the symbol of medicine is a stick with a snake. But what you don't realize is, look a little closer. It's not a stick. It's a cross. For those of you from England pubs that have a sword with a snake, it's not that. You were deceived. Tattoo, all right? It is a bronze. Now, bronze is always the metal of judgment, right? And it is the snake wrapped on the cross of judgment, right? All who hang on a cross are cursed for he having become a curse for us, right? They were told to see the cross of judgment and receive that if they saw that cross, they were healed of their sickness. <laughs> right? I cannot get more obvious than this. And the Bible says when he was raised up, he drew all. It wasn't he drew all men, although that's what's written in our English, what's written in the original text is he drew all that men have into himself. All sin, all sickness, all judgment was drawn into his body, on, put on him. And from him came healing and wholeness and forgiveness and salvation. Now here's the interesting thing. Four million people can't see a stick. It's too hard, I mean, I can't see the stick at the back of the congregation now. I need glasses. Four million people 
are sometimes kilometers apart. And God told them, put it in the center. So what would happen is if someone was five, six kilometers away from the encampment and they got bitten by a snake, they would look in faith in the direction of the snake on the cross. And they, now do you see how God works in patterns and pictures? So when the Bible says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, it is literally in the Hebrew, literally, stand still and see Yahweh. Now that is telling us today that we know who Jesus is by his person and his work. And we have the mystery of his fullness in the New Testament. The Bible is telling us when we cease from striving, playing Forex, writing 500 CVs, right? Those things are not bad, but when we do that first, we won't function from blessing. When first we cease, from our fears, our work, our stress. We cease from all that. We stand still and we go to his word to see Jesus. We see salvation. Whose salvation? Your salvation. My salvation. We see that the Lord has us in the palm of his hands. And then from that doctrine, speaking to us who we are, we correct our lives to function from righteousness, not flesh, not natural fear, not natural effort, right? Look at this. They are then instructed, after they see the salvation of the Lord and what he will accomplish, right? The Lord will fight for you in verse 14, Exodus 14, verse 14. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace right? Your peace. It is only after that that God tells Moses, stick the rod in the water. The instruction for the natural thing, how to fix a business, how to fix something, how to address something, how to be safe, how to move, is lost. We seek it first. Why does God put it lost? Because God is a relational God. We learned last week, he wants to function as your heavenly father. In Hebrews chapter 12 tells us, if you do not have a father relationship with God, where you see him as the one who gives you all wisdom, all correction, all love. We learned that a good father corrects a child more than 50% of the time, right? My kids would not be alive if I was not around, categorically, They thought they were Superman and could jump off the roof of the house. They thought that they could run across roads when cars are going. They thought that they could put their fingers in a plug. I I don't correct them because I discipline them because I hate them. I correct them for their good, to raise them up, right? So Hebrews 12 is telling us if we don't see God as our Father first, and go, heavenly father, and father is not something lightly. People never had a relationship with God as father until Jesus came. He was the first to address the almighty, the all-powerful, the Elohim, as Abba. And we, we take it so lightly. No, 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 this new covenant that we live in through Christ, we are family of God, and not just distant relatives, his direct children. And he comes into our lives and he says, first receive me, my doctrine, my love for you, my grace for you. But from there, we can get our instruction into righteousness. We just want the instruction because we don't want the relationship, right? That's the flesh. But actually, once you have the relationship, the instruction is natural, right? It's effective, And so in this world of crisis, it's stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. Have the revelation that he will fight the battle for you and receive his peace that he died to give us. His peace. What's the one thing that is robbed from us immediately when we see what's going on in the world? Peace. No peace. No peace. Even even scientists agree that if you live a stressed life, you kill yourself quicker. 
I'm not talking about diversion of suicide. I'm talking about when you live a stressed life, cancer cells, it reproduces death in your body. It's scientifically accepted. Stress is the biggest killer because stress leads to addictive behavior. Stress leads to lashing out. Stress leads to people having temper tantrums where they kill someone. With Stress leads to people drinking too much, taking too much. Stress, stress. And what is at the core of stress? Fear. I'm alone fighting this battle by myself. Now look at what God says. He always ties, I am with you. In Psalms 46, after be still and know is the Lord of hosts is with us. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 17, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, for the Lord is with you. Now we go to Philippians chapter four, verses four. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You will not get peace if you are not pursuing Jesus. It's through Jesus, not through you, not through an economy, not through a king. People, can I just say this? If Jesus isn't your priest, somebody is your priest. And by priest, I mean somebody who engages God for you. So I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about we, will, we always function. Human beings need all the functions of Jesus. Priest, king, I mean, they're, they're all there, right? But the interesting thing is, if Jesus isn't your priest, somebody else will be. If Jesus isn't your king, somebody else will be. We have always got thrones occupied in our lives. So right now, right now, if you were to ask yourself questions about how you react to certain situations and what your belief is about the world, will reveal whether Jesus is your priest, whether Jesus is your prophet, or whether Jesus is your king. Right? But what I guarantee you is if he's not, there's no peace. Where there's no peace, there's stress, striving, strife every evil work, right? So the fascinating thing is, we've gotta put Jesus as our pursuit. So it's through, made our, make our requests known to God is a starting point of communication. The second thing is through Christ Jesus. What does this mean for me in Christ? In Christ, who am I in Jesus? What is he doing for me? What is he working for me? He's my healer, he's my provider. That, that's, why, that's why the tithe is such a big deal. Because if you can't tithe, he's not your king. He's not your provider. Somebody else is. And whenever somebody comes up to me and says, my business, my this, my stress, my strife, I'm not saying your business doesn't go through trying times. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how you are and how you be and what the fruit and the longevity is. But you'll always find there's something going on there because the devil says you can't afford to, right? I'm not condemning anyone. I'm speaking to me, all right? But is Christ responsible for my provision? Oh, well, pastor, Jesus didn't speak much about tithe. Well, first of all, let's remember Jesus was there when the law was written. He was the author, right? So just because Jesus doesn't teach on tithing in full, doesn't mean he doesn't speak about it because it is spoken of in the New Testament in Hebrews that Jesus receives our tithe in heaven, that he might have something. But Jesus never said don't tithe. He said don't tithe without love. Meaning, do you feel loved? Or do you tithe in fear? Because at the time, people were being taught if you don't tithe, you'll be destroyed. And Jesus was saying, no, 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 don't give it out of fear. Give it out of a revelation of God's love for you but he never said don't do it but he in the New Testament is written by the Holy Spirit he receives our tithe so be very careful you only read what Jesus said whilst he was physically alive on the earth because he's still speaking and he's still he's still even though it's not a red letter it's him in the New Testament he's not separate from the Holy Spirit and he's like what are you saying Holy Spirit that's completely different to what I would say they're one right but now look at this we're staying in Philippians chapter 4 so the peace of God, which surpasses understanding. Why are you at peace? You shouldn't be at peace. 
will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, is there any virtue? And if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. So being unshakable, right? In times of crisis is, what is the first thing you read? What is the first thing you listen to? What is the first voice? Or what is the first throne you go to, right? Of course, we see there's enemies coming. You know, it's amazing in that story of the Egyptians chasing down the Israelites. It actually says, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord in verse 18. When I have gained honor, Exodus chapter 14, verse 18. When I've gained honor for myself of a fair, his chariots and his horsemen. And the angel of God went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went before them and stood behind them. So in essence, after they made that stand and they saw Jesus and they were being delivered, God said, I am in front of you and I'm your protection behind you, right? So the character of God being with you is a big deal. With you. God is not in some nation that is an island that has no war, no economic crisis, with sunshine, electricity, water, medicine, and no viruses. God's not hanging out on that island waiting for Armageddon to finish. And He's not saying to us, come find me here so that you can be safe. No, God says, where you are, when you stand still, you see me, you heed my instruction, and you line your life up with my word, I am with you. And I will be your front and your back. I will be your 360 degree protection. Something I need to highlight to you is serving the Lord doesn't mean you please people. It doesn't mean you please people. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were told, worship another God. And they said, no. And you know what the thing is? If we were there and we were God, we would have said, God, spare them from being thrown into the furnace. Spare them from being thrown into the fire. But what was even a greater testimony was the fourth man in the fire. Where God says, I don't need to stop the fire. I'll just stop the fire destroying you. Right? And the most amazing thing is the one thing burned up by the fire was their their shackles, their rope shackles, their chains that were made out of fabric were the one, because it said, I see, I threw in three men bound. I see four men loose, right? I wanna encourage you. God wants to do such a work in a season of shaking that the things that held you hostage, you get freed from. See, you don't need more money. You need to deal with the fear of having no money. You don't need to have more stuff. You need to deal with the fear of never being valued. You don't need another partner. You need to work through God giving you value apart from a person that you can love someone in a way that is supernatural, right? So in this season of crisis, God wants to do a work in you to such a degree that He stabilizes you to the core of your being. And He makes you immovable. And He makes you shine like a light in the darkness, right? Stand still, stand still. What's the first thing we do in a crisis? Run! <laughs> the banking system's gonna collapse. What happens? Everybody runs to draw their money, right? Panic, panic. And God says, listen, stand still, cease the panic, get in my presence. Can I just encourage you, church? Get in worship. Don't just come one song before the preach and leave. Oh, I've got to get out. I've got to get my kids out early. We do communion at the end of every service. That's where we point our bodies to the healed 
reality of who we are in Christ on the cross, receiving healing, and where we drink of His blood and we receive our redemptive, restored, righteous identities. Please don't leave to avoid five minutes of traffic, to avoid Holy Communion. Man, you're missing out on the point of this thing, right? Like, let's see this, this as the two hours every week where God meets us and He leads us and He heals us and He guides us. And you will be so productive out there. It will be supernatural. Amen. Can we pray together right now? Father, I thank you for everybody that's listened to this word today. What to do in a crisis. God, I don't know what they face. I don't know what they go through. But Lord Jesus, I declare over their life that they will build it upon you. That they will align it with you. Father, that you will divinely speak to them in their quiet times, in their devotions, as they listen to the word, as they worship you, God. Father, that you would order their life around you that you are with them, that your peace would be a mark in their lives. And Father, I thank you that whatever they face, Lord God, is nothing for you. Every battle we face is a battle for the Lord. And today, Lord Jesus, we declare we will not function out, outside of any other identity than children of God, righteous, accepted, ordained, anointed, and appointed for a time such as this. Lord, I pray there will be peacemakers in their workplace. They will pray over the sick, Lord God. They will see opportunities to share your word. We are alive for such a time as this to shine, to thrive, to rise, and to be used by you. We believe this, we receive this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we're going to be receiving, remembering our victory remembering our righteousness together. We're gonna to be receiving communion together. So if you can, wherever you are watching, take out some bread, some juice, some crackers, some water, anything to be the body and the blood of Jesus. This is such a precious moment. As you can see, it's not traditional. It's not about being traditional. It's about seeing God's power in our circumstance. This is our moment of remembrance where we see that God can turn a sick body into a healthy body and a person who is literally consumed with brokenness into someone who is whole, experiencing the shalom peace of God. So as we take this bread, this cracker, we speak and we say, this is Jesus's body that is broken for me. By his stripes, I am healed. And as we break and we eat, we receive and we reflect and we remember our healing is from the Lord. We are healed and whole in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And now we're gonna receive his blood shed for us speaks that you are righteous. In Christ Jesus, you will never stand before God and not be seen as righteous. God always extends the gold scepter to you and says, yes, my child, you are accepted, you are favored, you are pleasing. We remember today that Jesus shed his blood, that all our sin, past, present, and future, has paid for and full. We are loved and we are righteous in Christ Jesus. We receive together today. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Has given me.